1987. I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be a great one in the outdoors. Outdoors Forever is going strong. We've got a great outdoor fair coming up. Speaking of the outdoor fair, I think that might have been the high point of 1986. Let's look back on it first, so stay tuned. I'm Fred Trost. It's Thursday night. Time for Michigan Outdoors. From the rugged shore and woodlands of the north, it's history of copper mines and iron ore, the Great Lakes fisheries. To the farmlands of the southern counties, we'll look around again at all that waits the sportsmen in the state of Michigan. And sometimes when the moon brings out the diamonds in the snow and the stillness of the forest lies encased in Arctic cold, the wind might whisper through the trees, listen if you can. It tells you of the beauty in the state of Michigan. The Outdoor Fair 1986, an event we've been looking forward to all year, an event that four years ago when we held our first one. I hope that someday this would become a national event that would attain national acclaim. And folks, I think we did it this year. We had more attractions, more exhibitors, more people. In fact, if you wanted a motel room over the weekend in the Houghton Lake area, you had to go all the way north to Gaylord. The area was packed. The Michigan Duck Hunters Association got there in the morning for a shakedown of their act, waiting for the crowds, which came Friday at noon. A beautiful day, the sun came out, burned off the haze, the weather forecast for hot, humid, clammy thunderstorm weather was gone. The bird dogs were in rare form. Jaeger's Lust kennels brought a variety of English setters, Brittany's, German short hairs. It was a great demonstration on the training of a bird dog. Look at that English setter lock up on the quail. A thrill to the crowds as they explained how they go about training bird dogs. Of course, the kids had plenty to do, too. If they weren't interested in the dogs, they could go down to the Limberlost dock across the street from the high school see the water and kids show put on by the U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary. Coast Guard Auxiliary came and put on a number of demonstrations. This is the water and kids show, which is a safety show for kids in an entertaining way to teach them how to handle themselves around the water. How to handle your boat for adults? Well, the Walleye Brothers jumped into the act, <laughs> putting on quite an entertaining show. We had a number of activities around the water. I'm saying hit the darn thing. I'm trying to encourage these folks who want to dunk me in the dunk tank and earn a button for it Why would you want to, to do, do it. You You are a problem. You know that? This guy, look at this, OJ. This guy is a serious problem. I dunked him. I dunked Fred. Holy cow, you've been dunking all morning. <laughs> why don't you say anything about it? Come around to the camera. Tell him why you would do something like this to, to a guy who's on television trying to do hunting and fishing and archery. Because it's fun. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> because it's fun. That's what the entire outdoor fair is about, all the shooting events. Here they are, the dunkers. They're going to try to hit the styrofoam ball, and down I go. I tell you, there must have been... 25 or 30 people each day that dunk me and look at that fella in the blue shirt. <laughs> He's proud of it. He earned his buttons. We had a lots of shooting events. That's one of the main parts of the outdoor fair that I enjoy. Blue Skeen, world champion slingshot shooter. Did demonstrations teaching people how to shoot slingshots, and next year he's coming back with a slingshot championship. We're going to run at the outdoor fair. We're also going to have an air rifle championship, an air rifle tournament, one of the first of its kind in the state. Air rifles are increasing in popularity, and here's a little gimmick. How about an air rifle machine gun? You could give it a try at the outdoor fair. Well, that's a lot of fun for the shooters. If you're an archer and you want to maybe take a long shot at picking up a couple thousand dollars worth of prizes, Whoa, right next to old Slewfoot's head there came in that second arrow. Get your hunting bow out and take a shot at Slewfoot about 150 yards away. If you can hit the crest on that Stroh's can, you win the whole kitty. See that arrow next to the can, just to the left, that yellow spot? Oh, it's only a few inches away from the crest. But Slewfoot, 
stood intact the entire weekend. Nobody walked off with a big prize, and I'm sure that that will grow next year. On our shooting range, the handgun silhouette shooters from the Great Lakes Handgun Metallic Silhouette Association acquainted well over 1,000, close to 1,500 people to handgun shooting, target shooting with handguns. The Deadstream chapter of the Duck Hunters Association acquainted people, whoa, she got a kick out of that, with shotgunning. This is especially for people who haven't shot these guns before. And the muzzle loaders put a number of people through with the primitive weapons that date back to our colonial era. Kind of fun to shoot these for an awful lot of people who enjoyed it for the first time. The muzzleloader's village down in the grass right off of M55, easy to see from M55, attracted a lot of attention. Many, many muzzleloaders from around the state and their families camped out for the entire weekend, cooking their foods and living in this primitive encampment. What do they wear? Clothes that they generally make themselves. So they held a muzzleloader's fashion show, a colonial fashion show, to explain the variety of fashions that you saw in the muzzleloader's village. Quite an interesting attraction. And on Sunday morning at 10.30, the muzzleloaders staged a mock battle of the French and Indian War. Exciting for the crowds. The first time we've had that at the outdoor fair. And talk about exhibitors in the exhibit hall in the high school. Everything from people making snowshoes, taxidermists, wildlife art, Floyd Eccleston, and the world's largest broadhead collection. We had gun and knife people, exhibitors of fishing, hunting, and shooting equipment, drew crowds throughout the outdoor fair. We estimate that 15,000 people came to Houghton Lake this past weekend to enjoy the outdoor fair. The Michigan Big Game Hunters had Association had the biggest array of the biggest bucks I've seen since our hunting awards banquet. And Ron LeClaire, well, we told you he was going to treat the crowds with his group of longbow shooters. Look at this, shooting a disc out of the air. Looks difficult. Let's make a smaller target. How about a tennis ball? That was easy for them. Norm Blaker said, hey, I think I can hit 50 cents out of the air. So take a look at this. Here's Norm Blaker, traditional archer, shooting a 50 cent piece out of the air. And he got it, there's no doubt, in the highlighted area. You can see it and hear it. Took it right out of the air. Now Ron LeClaire said, hey, I've been practicing. I can shoot an aspirin. He got it, he got it. Look at it back in slow motion. You can see the white dot suspended. See that in the high, towards the bottom of the highlighted area? There, the arrow hit it. Ron LeClaire took an aspirin out of the air, a phenomenal show. We're gonna build on this next year with all of these people in a grand shooting show. And look at this fellow, 16-year-old Dave Strickland from Gross Eel. He threw four clay pigeons in the air himself and shot all four before they hit the ground. He's gonna be an attraction next year along with a lot of other people. Tell you, the outdoor fair, it's something you shouldn't have missed. I hope you put it on your calendar because next year, more attractions, more crowds, the biggest outdoor event of its kind in the country. You know, of all the events we do, and, and we have done, I think last year's outdoor fair was the greatest. It was, but wait till this year. It's going to be bigger, more attractions. And oh, better. Uh, oh, it, absolutely. It was phenomenal, but this, this year in the outdoor headlines, there was lots of news. In fact, there was lots of news generated just out of the DNR itself. 1986 saw a lot of changes within the DNR administration. The first change occurred in January when former senator and pro-sportsman activist Kerry Kammer was appointed to the Natural Resources Commission by Governor Blanchard. At the same time, retired Extension Service Director Gordon Geyer was also named to the commission. A big bombshell was dropped on us all in April when DNR Director Ron Skoog suddenly, and with no previous warning, resigned. He'd had a controversial tenure as director, but nobody expected the resignation. Almost as quickly as that happened, Commissioner Geyer resigned and took the post as acting director of the DNR. In May, he commissioned a blue ribbon committee known as the A-Team to study the structure of the DNR. The report was issued in July, and Geyer, not a man to put off the hard decisions, began reorganizing the DNR immediately. Also in July, Geyer announced he'd stay on as director until July of 1988. Now, don't bet on that, because most of us feel he'll change his mind and stay until the end of 1990. 
The legislature was also busy this year making an impact on hunting and fishing. In March, under the leadership of Representative Tom Scott, the license fee package passed and was signed into law. This fee package saved the bacon of wildlife, fish, and law divisions at a time when layoffs of biologists and conservation officers were just around the corner. Along with the license hikes, the legislature okayed a second deer license for bucks only, known as the two deer bill. In April, Senator Kirby Holmes introduced a resolution to look at Michigan's hunting and fishing laws to see how they affect handicappers and what changes they might need. The report was issued in the last few days of 1986. In July, perhaps the best thing that ever happened to conservation law enforcement was passed by the legislature. This bill called for huge fines and mandatory jail sentences for illegally taking or possessing certain types of game. The public reaction was overwhelming in its support of the new law, and the judges haven't backed off from socking the high restitution sentences, in the case of a deer $1,000, to those who are caught poaching. The DNR Law Division, led by new chief Herb Burns, also had a good 1986. They kicked off the year with a major case involving illegal fur trading in the Upper Peninsula. Armed with the new poaching laws in July and a whole lot of citizen cooperation, officers made more cases against poaching and made them stick when they got to the courts. 24 more conservation officers were hired this year, bringing a bare-bones contingent of officers at least back to a reasonable level. 16 of those officers graduated the day before the gun deer season from their academy and were on the job opening day. Michigan anglers had a bang-up year in 1986, and the fish division, bolstered by increased funding, enjoyed a good year, too. Although the announcements didn't come until late in the year, plans were announced to hire 55 additional full-time employees to create more public access for fishing, renovate hatcheries, carry out lake studies and surveys, all with a plan to improve fishing, especially in southern Michigan. Additionally, plans were announced to restock grayling in the Upper Peninsula, and Atlantic salmon plants were made in a number of inland lakes. In the hunting world, it was impossible to tell whether 1986 was the year of the pheasant, moose, deer, elk, or turkey. Great strides were made in the management of all of these species. In late February, historic releases of half-breed ringneck and Chinese blackneck pheasants were made in Ottawa County and in the Thumb. The results were better than expected. The moose population remained stable in the UP and even expanded a little. Turkey transplants continued all over the state with a special effort made in southern Michigan. In November, the DNR Wildlife Division made a couple of stunning announcements. They had decided to make the first plant of pure strain Chinese blackneck pheasants close to the Washtenaw Livingston County border. Moose Lift 2 was announced to the public as an effort to bring 30 or more moose from Ontario to Michigan's Upper Peninsula. Southern Michigan hunters for the first time were allowed to use handguns during the firearm deer season. And in December, when the preliminary deer harvest numbers were calculated, they showed the best season on record. One major wildlife issue still remains, however, and it's locked up tighter than a drum in the appeals court, and that's the dove issue. Although the appeals court promised a speedy decision, it's been well over a year since that promise was made. Michigan Outdoors and PBS enjoyed a prosperous 1986, too. In March, we brought back to television the wild game cooking contest, much like the one Morton F. hosted on Michigan Outdoors for many years. Approximately one month later, we began work on a non-profit organization dedicated to keep everyone that wants to hunting and fishing. In September, it was incorporated and Outdoors Forever was formed. The first Thursday in November, Michigan Outdoors completed its fifth year on PBS and began its sixth. The only major disappointment of the year occurred late in the legislative session in December when Governor Blanchard asked the legislature not to send him a bill that would prevent local governments from passing anti-gun ordinances. Many of us were surprised that the governor, who has been a supporter of pro-gun bills, had taken that position. All in all, 1986 was an excellent year for sportsmen in Michigan, and the prospects for 1987 couldn't be too much brighter. This guy is something. Yeah. Isn't he? He most certainly is. Bob Garner knows the stuff in the outdoors, and I have been uh, reminded of this. <laughs> Every now, now and then. Now, Kath, you're in on this, too. On this <laughs> sort of. This was in our mailbag here oh, not too long ago. Picked up. <laughs> now, now this, is, this was by a fellow who asks that his name be withheld by request in Atlanta. He says, he wrote to me after Big Buck Night, and he said, uh, Fred, everyone enjoys a little good-natured teasing and joking during and after the hunt, but after a while, enough is enough. Why do you continuously put down Bob Garner? Mr. Garner brings a great deal of media professionalism and outdoor <laughs> skill to your program, 
and you reward your TV co-host and hunting fishing partner with unending cheap shots. You mention his physical size, <laughs> various misadventures, and then you really get excited and publicly embarrass Bob if he doesn't come home with a bag limit of game. My impression of Mr. Garner is that of a knowledgeable sportsman, a professional who is good as, a, uh, good as his work, and the kind of guy I would invite to my camp. Mr. Garner projects the kind of image that is good for Michigan sportsmen. Well, it's not from his mom. <clears throat> that's I, not from your it's mom. It's a real that's letter. From... I'd like to send a guy 10 bucks if I can get his address <laughs> or something. But no. seriously, you know, it seems like here we are on the first show of the year with mm -hmm. resolutions, and, and this guy really would like me to make a resolution, not to... Not to pick on Bob. I'll tell you what, do me a favor. Do me a favor. You two make a resolution, mm -hmm. you'll keep picking on me, because that is a lot of fun in the outdoors. We have a good time when we go hunting and fishing and working on the show and all that. And if you guys didn't pick on me <laughs> and I didn't pick on you, I think we'd all be worried about He just about brought things. up a point right here there that you we folks go. do not see on TV. <laughs> yes. The biggest prankster in all outdoors <laughs> is sitting right here. He has done more bald jokes. Only people that know more, him would know that. More yeah. short, short jokes. jokes. Yes. <laughs> this guy has a great sense of humor to boot, but he is a real pro. Bob? Yeah. Thank I, you very much, I, Fred. I can't make that resolution. <laughs> can't keep it. No, thanks. Hey, by no. the way, your head's a little shiny. Yes, <laughs> I know that. But we have a lot of fun on Michigan Outdoors, and we do appreciate Bob's work, and I hope none of you really take too much offense at that. We like to keep it. I love it, too. Now, let's lighten up a little bit <laughs> and take a look at this week's question in our outdoor quiz. Faced with the problem of vegetation that is out of reach, moose ward off starvation with a behavior that deer have not learned. What is it? While deer stand on their hind feet trying to reach leaves, twigs, and buds, a moose will straddle saplings and ride down their meal. Breaking the young tree results in a new one growing in its place, a feeding technique deer would find beneficial if they could learn it. Uh, um, uh, we shouldn't be laughing today. No. We promise, but something about Garner There's... doing a quiz about the eating habits of moose, <laughs> riding down, down trees. mowing down trees, I, I'm not going to make any... I can just any... see it now. Yeah, yeah I know. It makes perfect good sense to me. Yeah. Yes, uh, I bet it we does. We knew that. I bet it does. Well, what now, an idea. Let's introduce Roger McCarville and Catherine Mulhaupt from Outdoors Forever. We have big plans for 1987. And, of course, the background on this is that Bob and Kathy and I uh, put together Outdoors Forever back in the spring. Had a, a little workshop what? for handicappers is the way it started, but it's developed into much more than that. Mm -hmm. Kind of an exciting year ahead, right, Raj? Looking forward to it. I think, uh, as you mentioned, there's, uh, everybody's involved in Outdoors Forever. The My Pet Project. Let's talk about some of our pet projects coming up. My Pet Project in Outdoors Forever is one that is aimed not just at handicappers, but at youngsters and oldsters and all of us. It's pier fishing. And when we take a look at the piers that we have in this state, we have some nice piers, but they weren't designed for fishing. A lot of people have found that you can catch a lot of fish off of these piers. Many of the piers are somewhat unsafe, you might say. For handicappers, Raj, they're not really accessible. The parking lot is too far away from the pier. There's sand blocking the access. The bathroom facilities are closed or non-existent or not around. And also, we can do a lot to improve fishing around these piers. We have done virtually nothing in this state with pier fishing. And I enjoy fishing from piers. I think you would, Raj. I think handicappers have a lot of time. Senior citizens have a lot of time. Um, yeah. Kids, a, it's a great way to take kids fishing. Right, that was a big thing in our survey, that people were saying they can't get to the pier, and if they get there, the parking's not close, or as you said, the sand is there. But it's one thing they can do, handicap and able body together. That's, uh, that's my pet project. In fact, I'd like to see a pier put out on Houghton Lake. Mm -hmm. That's one of my little, <laughs> uh, on an inland lake like that, I think that'd be great. What's your pet project for Outdoors Forever this year, Raj? An educational center, somewhere where we can start dealing with the safety how do you get out in the woods in a wheelchair? How are you going to hunt? How are you going to hold the gun? How are you going to roll with it loaded? And all kinds of things like that. The same thing with the fishing. How do I get on a boat or in and out of a boat? How am I going to be secured in there? A demonstration center, an actual building, a facility with right. water. That's a sort of a dream we have in Outdoors Forever to put together, and we can uh, do an awful lot with an area like that. Catherine? My pet what, project? Your pet pro projects. Your projects. You have a lot of them. Many of them. The Information Center is sort of the umbrella title for all the ones that I'm interested in, including uh, providing fact sheets on various types of equipment, techniques, um, resource organizations, handicapper laws. Um, also, 
putting together some a computer network that not only will we be getting this information out in print, we'll be making it available to people in their own homes if they want it. That's right. We haven't started this yet, but I think we're just on the brink of being able to provide information sheets on things that we've had on the air uh, about handicaps and about, uh, well, like you said, fishing Devices. equipment. We get a lot of requests right. about fishing equipment. Especially. What could, what could mm -hmm. people use with one hand? Mm -hmm. We're going to we be, have some devices mm -hmm. that we, we know of. Right, and we're going to be testing them, putting this information out. And, of course, Michigan Outdoors TV show has become an important part of Outdoors Forever, as well as the Digest and the supplement in the Digest. Yeah. And uh, we'll be continuing that. All of this, by the way, is under the Outdoors Forever umbrella in 1987. Outdoors Forever is really for the production of this show, going to be the fundraising source and putting it all together, and then out, Michigan Outdoors becomes one of the things that, that happens underneath Outdoors Forever. Right. It's going to be a great year. Not just a great year, but I think because of Outdoors Forever, it's going to be a great lifetime because it's going to extend my hunting and fishing. Oh, and mine. Mm -hmm. And it's fact, Outdoors it's Forever for everyone. For everybody. Yep. That's the theme for 1987. Now let's take a look at some of the events coming up, and all of the events we have in the Outdoors Club involve Outdoors Forever activities as well. You'll see Raj and Catherine there. And let's take a look at some of these events right now. January 10th, 1987 is our Stroh's Hunting and Fishing Awards deadline. Deer and elk must be 10 points or more, and turkeys must have an 8-inch or longer beard. Black bear is a new category in the Stroh's Hunting Awards and must be a minimum of 250 pounds. The Fishing Awards deadline is also January 10th, 1987, and those who entered the DNR Master Angler Program are automatically entered. Fish meeting or exceeding the Stroh's Award minimum length must have their applications in by January 10th. Minimum lengths for each species of Michigan fish can be found in Fred Trost's Outdoor Digest. The deadline for the Fish and Wild Game Cooking Contest is February 16, 1987. There are five categories in which you can enter your favorite recipe. Dips and appetizers, chowders, soups and stews, small game entrees, fish entrees, and big game entrees. Now this year, all recipes must be entered on an official entry form, which is in Fred Trost's Outdoor Digest. No entries will be accepted unless they are on the official form. Fred Trost's Hunting Awards Banquet is slated for Saturday, February 21st, 1987 at Romas of Livonia. There you'll find the biggest bucks, elk, turkey, and bear taken in 1986. And Fred Trost's Fishing Awards Banquet is also slated for Romas of Livonia, Saturday, March 7th. The biggest fish and the best fish stories of 1987 will be there for you to see and hear. Fred Trost Outdoor Fair is set for Friday through Sunday, June 26th through the 28th at Houghton Lake. Be sure and schedule your vacation time so you can join us at the fair. You can get more information on any of these events by calling Fred Trost Outdoors Club at 517-337-8142. And that's a look at this week's Michigan Outdoors calendar. You can't go wrong with this recipe. What a way to start off the new year. Oh, could use leftover turkey? Oh yeah, that's right, you could. This is, <laughs> it's called Easy Pot Pie, off, used with game birds by Ken Kilpatrick from Battle Creek. He sent us this recipe. Oh man. You know, pot pie recipes are hard oh, to beat. Oh, that's right, the Especially ingredients. Just... When, when they're so simple as this. Oh, <laughs> this one is. Take a look at the pheasant that we use Look at that white meat, Bob. This is just boiled pheasant. Now that is a wild pheasant. Mm -hmm. Look at that right there, a piece of shot. Yep, there it which is. Which we want to remove. <laughs> yeah. Luckily, but, we found it there. But that bird was taken from the wild and yep. it ended up in his pot pie. You get gravy, peas, onions, and carrots, and mushrooms, and basically all these, just chop them. I mean, there's you know not a whole lot to it. And there's the pheasant or the game bird. Or, or the turkey leftover or whatever turkey, whatever you chicken. Want. Gonna slice some mushrooms here, just small slices, put them right on top. You don't, it doesn't take a lot of dishes either. That's another th nice well, thing about this. The only thing you have to make sure is that you have a large enough pot That's to put right. it in. That's right, And to begin then with. start yep. adding the ingredients. Just about anything you want. You can add more or less. Get carrots and onions and peas. Frozen peas, yep. that, they add a lot of color. And they sure do. And home style gravy, I mean, it's, you know, that's your sauce and broth actually. And that's just about it. And then you roll out your pie crust. Well, a little bit of spice here. Just salt and a little pepper. bit of salt and pepper. But there isn't any spice to you speak don't need of it. in this. You don't need it. Not with the carrots and peas. And it does onions. does tend, I think, to bring out the flavor of the of the pheasant. Yep. Or you could use it with grouse. Probably oh. duck. It, I bet it would work. Oh, 
You don't think so? No, I, I'd rather use it with hey, a it's bird. worth a shot. You know? It's worth a yeah. try, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Get launch pie crust here and it doesn't take much. Well, you don't have to make a pie crust from scratch either. You, no, you can, can buy them. You can kind of cheat a little bit, yeah, that's right. Can... As long as it's easy, you might as well make the whole thing easy. You can put this right on top and just kind of crimp the edges and fold it around because you don't want the juice leaking out the side of your dish. So it's no big deal to put nope. a pie crust on the top nope, of something sure isn't. like this. And then you're going to slit the top a little bit, let the steam out, and that's about it for this. Doesn't cook very long either, about 50 minutes in the oven at 350 degrees. And there we go. And the mushrooms and the peas and all of these things have been completely cleaned up by Bob. <laughs> mm -hmm. Second helping time. You know, Freddie, I've been trying to lose a pound or two here Doing very good. lately. Yeah, and I made a New Year's resolution that I wouldn't go back for seconds on Michigan Outdoors this year. Oh, so you're waiting but, for me to dish them up. But what the heck, you know, I might as well. <laughs> this is only the first show of the year. Yeah, right. Right. yeah, the resolution had a short, short life on that. Look at the pheasant in here, and you can see the different pieces of meat. There's some dark meat, which I think if, it, if game birds taste like anything, it tastes a little bit like turkey. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and especially when it's just in boiled. In a recipe like this. Mm -hmm. That's right. Good, Can't be good, beat. good, hearty recipe. Yeah. Great for those snowy afternoons, oh, Sundays, yeah. you know. Do you think it takes anything away from the flavor of the pheasant? No, absolutely not. It's, you There's can taste the vegetables and it does bring it through. That's right. Easy great Pot recipe. Pie from Ken Kilpatrick from Battle Creek. What a recipe, a great way to start out the new year. We're looking forward to a great year here on Michigan oh, yes. Outdoors. We're going to catch some fish ice fishing, Don. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we'll be after them next week. So join us, and I hope you can get outdoors this weekend. It's a great place to be. See you next week. If you'd like a copy of this recipe for Easy Pot Pie, it's in the January-February issue of Fred Trost's Outdoor Digest. There's also a special eight-page supplement that explains the goals and aims of Outdoors Forever and tells what you can do to help. For a free copy of Fred Trost's Outdoor Digest and information on how you can join our Outdoors Club, write to us here at Fred Trost Outdoor Digest, P.O. Box 6001, East Lansing, Michigan, 488. Two, three. There's no doubt in the highlighted area. You can see it and hear it. Took it right out of the air. Now, Ron LeClaire said, hey, I've been practicing. I can shoot an aspirin. Got it. He got it. He got it. Look at it back in slow motion. You can see the white dot suspended. See that? In the high, towards the bottom of the highlighted area. There, the arrow hit it. Ron LeClaire took an aspirin out of the air, a phenomenal show. We're going to build on this next year with all of these people in a grand shooting show. And look at this fellow, 16-year-old Dave Strickland from Gross Eel. He threw four clay pigeons in the air himself and shot all four before they hit the ground. He's going to be an attraction next year, along with a lot of other people. I tell you, the outdoor fair, it's something you shouldn't have missed. I hope you put it on your calendar, because next year, more attractions, more crowds, the biggest outdoor event of its kind in the country. Michigan Outdoors is made possible in part